Welcome to Syntax. Today we have a fundamental show for you again. These are shows that we do every now and then about fundamentals, about different types of programming. We have them on TypeScript and JavaScript and CSS, and we've got quite a few of them. And we realize we actually haven't done a full-blown HTML fundamentals episode just yet. And that is one of the very first building blocks that you learn. And having a good base to build your house upon is crucial. So here we are today. We're going to talk to you all about why good HTML is important, a good structure, what does semantic elements mean, and just basically how do you, when you're authoring a website or a web app, how do you tackle that and make your HTML look like onions, uh, which is a good thing, by the way. <laughs> I, that saying, saying onions is only a reference that like people from the Toronto GTA area get. Um, maybe I should explain it because I often will say like, ooh, onions. So Chuck Skorsky, who is the commentator for the Raptors on TV, whenever a, if you just Google onions, baby onions, you'll find like all these highlight reels of like, like crazy Vince Carter doing like mm. wild stuff back in, I don't know, when was Vince Carter? Through, through the legs, underneath the leg. Dunk. Yeah. yeah. And then Chuck Swirsky would just go, onions, baby, onions. And uh, <laughs> it's like, you Is it because it makes you out. cry? It's so good it makes you cry? Is that? Oh, maybe. I, I never considered it. I just am, I'm very, I love slang that is, like when somebody throws out a slang that I've never heard, but you kind of understand, mm. I like I read Urban Dictionary like at least <laughs> once a week just to sort of get new, new one-liners. And saying it's, it's so good. Do you do you read Urban Dictionary? I almost always pull it up when my wife says something that she does not understand the the meaning behind because she works in a school, right? So she hears things, yeah, and she's not always up on the latest slang. So I have to say, well, um, maybe you want might want to reconsider saying that. <laughs> yeah, I also do it before I like say anything on this podcast because only once have I did I say something on this podcast where I didn't realize the meaning behind it and it was just like something I had heard so I started saying it and then now I realize I should probably check that there's no uh not hurting anybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you know what is hurting people? What? Your bad code because they you don't have visibility into the errors that you're serving people and it's, it's it. making them have a bad time. Maybe if it's even raising their stress levels and actually physically hurting them. I couldn't tell you know, there's sometimes when I use a website and uh there are issues in it and I get really like, gosh, if only they would have done this, I wouldn't be so angry. Why don't you put a timeout on this? All kinds of things, right? Yeah. And that's where we need visibility into our apps. So that way we know when people are potentially hitting issues or slow pages, right? Things that uh, are cause turmoil in everyday usage of applications. And that's where Sentry comes in. So you'll want to check out Sentry at Sentry.io. It's the perfect tool to get visibility. And not only just that, but make your applications better in all kinds of ways. So check it out. And uh, this podcast is brought to you by Sentry. So HTML. Hypertext, markup, language, Wes. Why is it important to uh, understand HTML? HTML. Do you know that I thought HTML meant Hotmail when I first saw it? Ooh. Like when I was a kid, you know, you'd see it in the URL bar. Yeah, and, yeah. well, uh, Hotmail was big. People who don't know, everybody had a Hotmail. What, you either had, you had Yahoo or you had a Hotmail. And I don't even know what the other ones were because most people had Hotmail. That I, The cool people had Hotmail. I just want to say yeah. that. Yeah, all the, all the like parents had like a, Oh, Comcast uh, like, or yeah, 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 the ISP L. email. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's funny because you can still tell when somebody's from the country because their email address, like written on the side of their truck, will be Damn. some obscure telecom that like beams internet over satellites from farm to farm. Yeah. And it, I often think like those poor people, like what are you going to do about that email address when you switch your ISP? That is a, the worst example that you could do. Anyways, HTML. Why is HTML important? A couple of reasons. It makes things easier to style. It makes e things easy to compose together. It makes things accessible. I mean that if you use the correct HTML elements to mark up your website, a lot of your stuff will be accessible by default. There's, there's going to be very little extra work on your end to make things accessible because simply just 
marking it up correctly is important. It's SEO friendly. Get Having Google and other bots be able to crawl and understand your content is important. It makes things have built-in default functionality. So we're starting now to see new elements hit the browser that have good default functionality, right? That Scott has some really cool examples a couple episodes ago on the details element, right? You pop a details. What's what's the markup for details element? Oh gosh, Is it details? details. Yeah, yeah. Um, details puts it into oh a summary and oh you're just talking about de- sorry details. It. Sorry, I was thinking yes. about um. um Dialogue. So I was like thinking, is does it have oh. inset baked in or not? But yes, well, dialogue details. too. Yes, dialogue as well. You know, they they do. They have things like baked in inset or pop over. Yes, pop over. Even display none display. You know, block whatever. Those types of things can be be baked in as well. And um, oh yeah, be, yeah, fun- functionality and styling on all these things is uh they're they're here for a reason. You know, you know, mm-hmm. and. Even more important now that we're getting all of these pop over and details and and whatnot is that it forms as well. These things are built on open standards. And when if you build them with these standards, picking them up with JavaScript and and actually building full featured web apps is so much easier because you have started with a really standard base and you're going to be able to pull in a library that understands how forms work or how details elements work or how the popover API works. Yeah. And I know you said this in accessibility, but yeah. interactivity as well, you know, whether whether or not, you know, you're adding a click event to a div or something like that. I mean, there's all kinds of things uh, that go along with that that fall into the category of both accessibility, but also just general usability. Exactly. So this word semantic gets thrown around a lot. And people always say, like, build your website with semantic elements. So what that means is that HTML elements that define the content that is inside of them will note to the browser, to uh, default styling, to screen readers, to browsers, to search engines, what type of content is inside of them. Meaning like, oh, you're, you're heading one through six that denotes sort of the table of contents of your website. You know, mm-hmm. paragraph text goes or goes inside of a paragraph element. And then we also have like non semantic elements, which are more used as building blocks for your layout. The most common being span element, which is inline and div, which is block. Yeah. I think that's an important thing to have an understanding of, because as we'll see, I think the document structure in general is something that it it makes a ton of sense when you have a wide view of it. And when you don't have a wide view of it or have a deep understanding about what a document structure should be like, it it might just feel like you're throwing elements at the wall. So let's talk about the basic structure of an HTML page. If you fire up most modern HTML pages, or at least HTML that is designed well, you know, you're going to see some of the same things every single time. The first one is going to be the doc type. Back in the day, we had a whole bunch of different doc types, and that had to do with what were what the different doc types? It was different versions of HTML. I almost forgot yeah, entirely like about HTML doc types. 4.1 strict. Right. Uh, there was so many of them. And they essentially noted to the browser which version of HTML to use. And that would help the browser understand how it should render out the elements on the page. Thankfully, we are mostly done that. It's been what, like probably 12 years since we just got doc type HTML. And what that will do is it will force the browser into the most modern rendering engine. And if you do not put it in, a doc type in, you will get a little message that says you're putting the browser into quirks mode, which I don't even know if I understand what a quirks mode feature is. Do you? (laughs) Oh, gosh. Yeah, I don't know. That'd be a good one for Stumped. Let's figure it out. In Quirks mode, the browser will attempt to render a page that will emulate the behavior of older browsers such as Netscape 4 and IE5. This can lead to inconsistent, unpredictable layout and rendering on the web (laughs) page. But like, does do modern browsers still like I've got the Quirks mode a couple months ago. So there's some poor soul still maintaining Quirks mode. That's funny. Anyways, that's uh, that's something you don't want. But yeah, your, your doc type goes in there and then you have and uh, the doc type, HTML. I should say, is just HTML these days. That's it. Yes. It's doc type, HTML. That's that's the doc type that we use. And then 
inside of that, we have our HTML tag, which is composed of your head and your body, right? Your, the head of your document is not visible. By default, you can do some pretty funky stuff where you can display block on the head oh, um, yeah. and make it content editable. I've done that TikTok twice now, and it always does super well because it's it's such a funny thing. But by default, the head of your document is there to provide metadata about the document. So what types of things go into the head, right? You've got often you'll have links to external resources like fav icons, CSS, uh, script tags. You'll have meta information for things like, I guess the fav icon is meta, but also like theme open color. graph previews, theme color. What else goes in there? Redirect tags. That would, This would be a good stumped. Name 10 things that go in the head. Ooh, yeah. Let's, yeah. let's Let's not do it yet, but we'll we'll wait for the next stumped. It's definitely something that, you know, you kind of experience, you pick up what goes in there at some point. But the way I like to think about it, when you're when you're thinking about HTML in general, it's oftentimes if you're not super experienced with HTML, it's important to think about like an HTML file as like a document or a file. And like you said, the HT the doc type first declares what type of file we're working with. The HTML tag says everything inside of here is going to be the HTML we're working with. The head is saying like, this is the metadata. <laughs> this is the information about the document. And then the body is the contents, the stuff you see, the, the visual things. So after we have our head, we have our body. Our body contains any number of elements inside of the body. And the typical structure for the body inside of there, and granted, you can throw a div immediately following the body or divs left and right, you know, div is just kind of like a blank element. But inside of the body, a very common way to lay out your application is to have a header tag, and then have a main tag, and then a footer tag. Now the the difference between the three of those is kind of interesting. The header, by default, if it's the is if it's in the child if it's in the context of the body, as in it's not inside of a section, nav, main, article aside, if it's just inside of the body and not inside any of those, it's mm -hmm. considered to have a, a landmark of banner, as in this thing is the main header that contains typically a logo and navigation and such. And the browser will understand that if you put a header at that level, it will most likely have those things. Now, so you can use header inside of a section, you can use it inside of an article, in the side, a main, yeah, and Yeah, you can have and, multiple headers per page, right? Correct. You can have multiple headers and footers per page, but the context in which they're understood by the browser happens to do with where they exist in the context of the document flow. And so a header inside of an article would be like if you had a blog post that had a header with heading information for the blog post, that would be perfectly fine to put that inside of a header tag as well. It's just not going to be registered as the landmark of banner because it's nested within a, an article. Now, main is actually, unlike header and footer, you can only have one main tag and you should only have one main tag. The main tag specifies the main content of the website. As in, this is not the header banner, this is not the footer, all that stuff in the middle goes inside mm -hmm. of the main tag. And so uh. you throw one of those, everything else in there is, that is the contents of the website. Interesting. I, I don't think I knew that, that having a single top level main tag, and I assume you can still throw a div around it if you want. Oh yeah. Like around yeah, the whole the website are almost, for, uh, for uh, style reasons. There. Yeah. Okay. But I'm on the W3C ARIA documentation. It says when only one main lane mark is on a page, a label is optional, meaning that you can tab to it and the browser will understand that this is the main content for the page. Um, however, it does say you can use multiple, but you must then label them with ARIA label by. Main tags? Um, yeah. I when saw MPN than... said mul you only use one. It, it would make sense that you would only use one because you only have one main piece of content for the page. However, sometimes, especially with components, if you, like, let's say you have a page that is the main content, but you want to display both of them on the page for whatever reason. You're writing a, you want to have two documents side by side. If that's the case, then you have to label them with ARIA label by, and that corresponds with the ID of a heading or, or something else that describes what is that content. So I, I guess that that would be a good example is if you had two documents side by side, 
Uh, here are two restaurant menus that you want to mm. view. You could say, here's the restaurant menu for McDonald's and here's a restaurant for Burger King. It's interesting because MDN says you mustn't have more than one main element that does not have a hidden attribute. Oh, so interesting. Interesting. Yeah. You know, main is kind of a newer. I mean, it's definitely newer in the context yeah. of the history of HTML, but definitely it's typically just pretty much use as here's the section where all your stuff is and that that's where you want to use it. Yes. Uh, next up we have the nav element. And the nav element, as you can imagine, specifies that this is going to be a navigation, a grouping of links. Now, one thing I always like wonder about this, me personally, Wes, is like when you have a nav, do you need an ordered list with list items inside of it? And typically you do see that anyways, right? People still define the navigation items as a list inside of the nav tag. But the nav tag is really just there to denote that this is going to be navigation for your website. Now, yeah. does that mean this is going to be the main navigation? No, not necessarily. In fact, you know, in an example on MDN, they have a nav tag around their breadcrumbs, which is just a, you know, breadcrumbs are, are a series of links to show you how deep you are in the nesting tree. So uh, nav tags, you know, doesn't have to be used once. This is interesting. It says typically the footer element often has a list of links that don't need to be in a nav element. I find that to be curious as why that might be. But hey, that's what MDN says. Interesting. Okay, so the question of do you need a ordered or unordered list inside of a nav tag? The answer to that is is no. You can put whatever you want. However, I don't feel good about simply just throwing anchor links inside yeah. of a nav tag because it is hard to style. And mm. if there is a situation where there is no CSS being applied, either it breaks or it doesn't load or whatever, it's just jams all the links mm. together. And sometimes you even run into, into the thing where there's no space between uh, each of the links and it's hard to read. So I much prefer a unordered list of links if it is unordered. I guess you use an OL if it was like a table of contents. And then I put an LI and then you throw whatever you want inside of there, divs and links so that you can style it however it is that you're looking. Uh, there can be more than one nav on a page. It says that if if you you know you do have more than one, then an aria labeled by can be used to promote accessibility. But yeah, you can have more than one nav per page. It doesn't you know typically what you're going to see in typical websites is a header with a nav inside of it. Potentially that that nav is a mobile nav, you know, hamburger menu type of thing deal as well. But yeah, yeah. so nav is not a use once only kind of thing. Here, here's a question. I, I'm just looking at my own website and I have a header element and then I have a nav element. And, and because of styling reasons, I put my H1 tag inside the nav element. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make sense. Is that wrong? What do you think? It I I don't think that necessarily matters, so to say, because heading tags kind of exist in their own hierarchy where the heading tag is being read as like a outline, which we'll talk about in, in just a little bit. So yeah. I, I think maybe we could use a, maybe a, a tighter uh, expert's opinion on that in that regard. But I don't I don't see why that would be a problem. In fact, there's even an example here on a MDN with an H2 inside of the nav. So um, I, okay. I, I don't I don't see that as being a problem. I'm myself. fine then. Yeah, uh, using my <laughs> my brain powers of deduction here. Next one is section. Now, section is an interesting tag. Again, it was added in the HTML5 days. So we used to just use divs for everything, right? You needed a nav, you used a div. A section, you needed a div. A side, div. Article, div, right? So all of these things are block level items, right, for wrapping content. But a section is specifically to denote a section of the document, which seems like it's self-explanatory. But typically, the way you use sections is that a section, even visually, if you're looking at a website, sometimes there's like big hard lines between color blocked areas of a website. Those would all be sections of the website. Yeah. And other times, you're just on a, uh, a page and it's just one big giant bit of information. That's one big section. So a section is to denote group of related content together in one group. Yeah, I often we should note that the like section doesn't give you any special functionality or features aside from I guess like like what 
I don't is there, I don't think there's any accessibility benefit to that. Maybe for for SEO. However, it does make things easier to architect your your layouts. Like Scott says, if you have big color blocks or like on my websites for all my courses, I'll often use sections because I have a section of what videos are in the course, what will I learn, FAQ, and I'll use those sections. And just I can grab them uh, with CSS and and apply all of my styles to them. Yes. And in addition, each section should have, and this is a should, not a must, should have a heading element to denote what that section is. So that's that's kind of where, you know, some of the special sauce comes in. It's like if you have a section and then you have an H1 through 6 there to denote what that section heading is, then we're saying, all right, this bit of content all falls within this heading. Um, Likewise, we have an aside which an aside is typically used for sidebar content. You know, back in the day, and even still today, the, the, the whether it was the golden layout or we typically have a left-hand column with, you know, potentially navigations or filters or all kinds of things or right na- either sidebar navigation, right? Often called a sidebar. And aside is for exactly that. It's for content that is not the main content. It is Aside, it is it is a uh, you could call it a sidebar, but uh, visually it does not always have to be a sidebar, which is why it is called an aside. Yeah, and aside can also be really handy for just little did you knows or yes, call out little asides <laughs> uh, yes. when you're writing an article because you say okay I'm I'm writing this article and aside why didn't you do it this way. And then it's it's great. You pop a little aside in there. You can style it a little bit differently. You can even, dare I say, float it because you can. <laughs> you People say, oh, floats are dead. The one use case for a float right now is if you want text to wrap around an element. So if you, you have an aside where just like, did you know the average website uses four kilowatts of energy per year? And you could just like put a little boop right in there like those pop-up music videos back in the day and then have the text wrap around it, aside is the perfect element for that. Yeah, totally. Likewise, article. Article is an element to denote an article. What is an article? Well, you have a blog. What does your blog have? It has posts, also known as articles. Those are articles. So an individual post could be seen as an article. Also, like if you have a list of things, right? Let's say you have a listing of podcast episodes on the Syntax website. There's a big old listing of podcast episodes. Those could be considered an article themselves. So a document will have a bunch of different articles, typically to denote like content that is grouped together, but as a something like I think the best way to describe it as like a newspaper article, a forum post, a blog entry, those types of things, that's an article. Next up, we have the span, the mighty span. So the mighty uh, span, I get like, let's explain it real quick. Block and inline are the two sort of displays in CSS. There's there's obviously a lot more than that. There's there's probably can we do a little trivia right now? How many displays can we together come up with all the displays? There's display none block inline, inline block, flex, grid, grid, inline flex, contents. Sorry, what did you say? Inline flex. Inline flex. That's the thing, right? Inline grid. Yep. Yep. I said contents. Display. Display contents. Uh, So that's nine. Display table. Yes. Display. There's some weird ones like. um, I know display there's so like unordered lists are something weird unordered lists I i'm pretty sure display. let me see if i can get all the properties no, okay they're they're block by default unordered lists are display block for some reason okay I there's thought. table row oh table table row so that's there's 10. list item which we we yeah okay did you i didn't know that you could do multi-words so there's display block space flex block space flow block flow hyphen root i do not what? know what those are what is display flow root now that is not one that i know flow root oh interesting okay so wes it seems like the multi-word syntax is to be sure your layouts work in older browsers you may use the single value syntax for example display inline space flex 
would have the following fallback of inline hyphen flex. So the inline hyphen flex is the older way to do it, and the newer way to do it is with multiple values of inline space flex. Oh, really? Really, so, yes. Did not know that. Hey, we uh, just learned something major So here. display yeah. block space grid is the same as display grid, but display inline space grid is the same thing as display inline grid? Correct, yes. Oh, I yes. didn't know that. I Did not either. Welcome. I've, very uh, rarely, but every here. now and then I need an inline flex, and I'll just use inline dash flex. So now you can use multi keyword. Yes. Wow. And by the way, flow root, which is interesting. I've never heard of flow root. The element yeah. generates a block box that establishes a new block formatting context, defining where the formatting root lies. I don't I don't know. I don't know what, what that, does that yeah. Mean? I don't know. The element uh, display flow, the element lays out its corresponding or its contents using flow layout. If its outer display type is inline and it's participating in a block inline formatting context, then it generates an inline box. Other than it generates a block container box. <laughs> okay, those You're are words, words, right? Now. Those are words, right? Those yeah. Are words. Hey. <laughs> wow. Flex and grid containers are defined by an elements display. These are similar to block formatting context, but there are no floating children available inside the flex. Yeah, it's there. It's yeah, there. It's Who's using that, right? Wow. If you're uh, using display flow, let me know. I want to hear all about root. why you're display flow or flow root, which actually it looks like they're not like they're not. I would have figured those were like old properties that we're not using anymore, but it was added to Chrome in 2017. So it's not super old. Added to Safari in 2019. Oh, here, can I use comes in with the uh, the reason why you might use this. It provides a better solution to the most use cases of the clear fix hacks. So it's when you're using floats and things are taken out of the oh. document. It's like, a, it's a fix for clear fix uh, that we used to have to do. Interesting. Yes. Cool. Well, we, I think we got them pretty close. I think the yeah. only one we didn't hit was the, the, flow, the one. flow root one. And then there, there's a couple other like internal ones like display table caption and display Ruby text, but that's internal. That's not something you use in CSS. Word. Um, cool. So, hey, what, what were we talking about before we started span. playing games? Span. When we use the span <laughs> versus a div versus a paragraph tag. Why do you use a span when you have a div and a paragraph tag? Yes, because span by default, their styling is inline, meaning that it does not break onto a new line when it creates itself. So if you want to wrap a couple words, or you want to wrap something without disrupting the flow of the document, then you use a span. And also, of course, you can change those types of things in CSS, but it's really nice just to know when I see a span, I know that that is only there because it will, A, is going to not break the layout, and B, is probably being picked up in CSS to add a highlight or something like that. And even in that case, I used to always throw a span around to highlight stuff until I found out about the mark tag, mm. which is intentionally meant for highlighting elements. Yeah, and, and speaking of that, if you find yourself wrapping things in a span and then immediately throwing a display block on it, chances are it should just be a div or maybe even a paragraph tag if it's paragraph or text. If you're finding yourself wrapping something in a div and immediately putting a, a display inline on there, you should probably be using a span. Span is the generic wrapper for inline content, as you said, Wes. So you want to know a little trick I came up with the other day? CSS, if you have a block element and you want to keep all of the blocky attributes, meaning that it breaks before and breaks after, it can take a width and a height, it can do all of that stuff, but you don't want it to span the entire width because block elements by default will go all the way across width-wise. You can put a width min content on it and it will suck to the content, but not give up all of that like clear before and clear after. So uh, grab a display block element, give it a width of min content and then pop a background on it. And you'll see what I mean in that it will simply just apply the styles to how wide the content makes it, but still not break before and after. Hmm. Word. Hot tip right there. And also hot tip, figure and caption. People don't use figure and caption all that often for, for 
I don't know why, but they don't. Figure and caption are a way to do it like a self-contained image illustration, diagram, code snip, and, and caption. And so, again, this is not necessarily that important, but it gives semantic meaning to these elements. And if you have something that is, let's say, a picture with a caption on it, mm-hmm. right? That seems like a perfect opportunity to use a figure. It's fig caption, which I always found to be weird. It's figure and fig caption instead of figure caption, which or just yeah, caption. Right. Why they abbreviate fig? That, huh. That's a that's a great point. I wonder wonder why that is the case. And couldn't it also be just caption? Just Anyways, caption. that it was yeah. too long ago that it was added. So. It's oh, there is available. a caption tag. Wait, why is there a caption tag as well? A caption tag is for a video element, is it not? Caption or, element no, specifies... Tag. It's for a title or for a table. A caption specifies the title of a table. So oh. caption must have already existed because it was in Chrome version one. Yes. Um, yeah, this okay, has only so been that's why they did years. fig caption. But they should have still done figure caption. I, I think so. Yeah. Maybe too long. I'm okay <laughs> with it. But... Yeah. I love the figure tag because it allows you just to make a nice tidy bundle. Sometimes you throw it uh, an image and then underneath it, you put a paragraph tag that describes it. And then, chart. oh, I got to I got to put those things together because I want to put a border around it. Oh, OK, throw a div around it. Oh, what do you call that thing? You know, image mm-hmm. container. It's called a figure. I love it. Yes. Use it yeah. a little bit more often. Same with the field set in in Formland. Field I know set. I'm getting ahead of myself. Yes. Field set is so good because a, you can give it a field set. What's the description of a field set? A legend. So that you can give a little description. Almost always I don't use that and I just strip off all the field set styles. And I use it because it allows you to group together a whole bunch of inputs and labels that are not and necessarily grouped together. And then you can disable all of them at once with the disabled attribute. Yes, I know. Field set, super underutilized. And it's an ancient and it's been around forever. Uh, it's a, a you know classic HTML element right there. Let's talk about S-tier order list. Yes, S tier element. Order list versus unordered list. That it the kind of the the definition for these two is in the name of them. If you need a list of things, you wrap it in a UL or an OL. OL is for things that have an order to them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, A, B, C, D, whatever. It has an order. They go in that order. Unordered list is typically things that are just here's some like related content like perhaps the navigation, and it is in a list of things that goes in an unordered list. So you'll often see unordered list for navigations, and you'll often see ordered lists inside of content whenever something has to be sequential in any sort of way. I love just going through the list of elements on MDN because I find all these ones that I didn't know about, or maybe I learned about it. Do you know what the DFN element is for? I feel like this is one of those ones we hit and stumped at some point. DFN. I feel like it is. Uh, I, I, my, my brain is not working this morning. No, tell me what DFN is. So if you have, it's a definition element. So mm-hmm. if, if you have a paragraph where you're explaining what something is, the thing that you are defining should be wrapped in a DFN tag. And then you can, I think by default, it will make it italic. So if I were to say display contents is a way for you to display the element based on its content size, that's a paragraph tag. I would wrap display contents in a DFN tag because that is the definition that I am then defining. Hmm. Yes. And likewise, there's a lot of funny, weird things like there's a time element for uh, when you have date time and then it has a attribute on it, date time that passes a, a date string. So that way, yeah. uh, you know, the browser knows that it's a date. There's so many little HTML elements. And I, I strongly encourage you to specifically and we'll have a link to this in the, in the show notes to go to the MDN page where it's HTML and then element. In fact, I'll even put it at the, uh, the top of the show notes here because this is a great place to just look. If you are looking to do something in HTML, this is uh, a great list of, of, you know, really descriptive tags and what exists out there. Maybe you didn't know there was a time tag and you, you saw it on here and now all of a sudden, oh, shoot, I have a time here. I could throw this in a time tag. Uh, next up on our list of things to talk about is form. Form is how you add interactive controls to your website. Forms are a 
standard part of the uh, you know the web in general forms are how we communicate to our server or how we do all kinds of things so like you mentioned with the form set a form is a big old beast you could probably have a whole episode on the form tag itself so we're not going to get too crazy into here but forms typically you know they have an action they they do something uh they have a button or an input type submit typically a button now these days do you ever use input type submit wes Input type of submit, yes. I no, I don't because input type of submit is very limited. And I much rather use a button with the type of submit because anything can go inside of a button. And you can style a button so much more. Yeah. Whereas input type of submit is a self closing element and your options for styling it are a lot less. Yeah. Buttons they both are great. function buttons the same are, way. Yeah. Buttons are if you're wondering why they both exist, then buttons are newer. Right, they're they're newer to. I guess I don't Are know. They've really? been around forever. Well, I, I don't remember a, a world without a button. I'm, I'm I, curious. Why is there an input type of submit and a I button feel type like of they submit are now? newer, but I don't have that actual understanding of when a button was added to CSS or HTML. Let's find out. Maybe even button type submit hasn't always been inside. I don't know. I could be spreading uh, incorrect things. Let's see. Oh, interesting. Hold on. An input type of submit takes additional attributes, including a form action, uh, indicating a URL for which to submit the data. This takes precedence over the action on the form element. Oh. So input, oh, this this input is also available on input type of image and button elements. Okay. And then you can do method. I knew that. I remember because when React server components came out, people were sort of, up in arms because a input type of submit can be outside of a form. Mm -hmm. And you can submit a form from outside of the form by giving it a form target attribute. However, you can put a form target on a button and an input. So that's not the difference. That's just a little fact. Interesting. Well, interesting nonetheless. Uh, And then, you know, in regards to that, I mean, there's a hundred... 100 HTML input types. So just head on over to NDN and look at all those. They're changing all the time. We're getting new date types. We're getting all kinds of stuff, color pickers, whatever. One of the big things that people talk about in HTML is button tags and anchor tags. Typically, you're always going to use an anchor tag if it's navigating to a new page and a button if it's performing some type of action interactivity on the page. Uh, So don't use a a button tag to, to navigate. Don't use an anchor tag and then prevent default and have it just change something yeah. on the page. Do what's appropriate. Crazy. Yeah. Or yeah. or the worst is they use an anchor tag and I want to open it up in a new tab, but it doesn't oh. go anywhere because they're just listening with JavaScript to to so, <laughs> sort of listen for the click on that element and then submit the form. That so, drives me nuts. Gusto does it, that. It, yeah, you hold it, you oh. hold command, you click it and then it it opens yeah. the page and oh and I'm gusto come on and nothing yeah or like um i think freshbooks has that where i want to duplicate an invoice it's a link right click open a new tab but it's a link with a listener on it so use a button in that case and almost all the time it's just because people don't want it to look like a button so they don't use a button you know they just want a text link so you have to go into your css and make a button with a class of naked that strips everything off of it or the opposite make a class of button that goes on your links to make it look like a button. Yes, I do both of those typically. Uh, last little bit, well, not last little bit, we also have headings, which we talked a little bit about, and, and these are the H1 through H6 tags. And it seems like you can't talk about these enough because even just the other day I saw on Twitter a conversation, it was like, how many H1s do you typically use? That's not the conversation you should be having. So if you want more like detailed information on this, head on over to Syntax. It's episode number 674. We did a heading design, which is not like aesthetic design, but how you structure your headings. Here's how you think in a, in a brief explanation. If you think about your website as like an article or maybe like a paper, you've been assigned to write a paper for class, right? Your teacher says, I need five pages on this. Typically, what you do is you give your paper a title and then potentially even write an outline, right? And then those outline becomes headings and, you know, you have paragraphs or maybe you just use that as an outline. You don't ever typically have more than one title 
of your paper, do you, right? I mean, that never happens where you have a, here's my paper on, you know, Radiohead's Kid A album, which is a paper I wrote in high school. My paper would not have multiple titles. You just have one title. That's your H1. That's what it should be, no matter what. And then if you're thinking about your website as if it were like an outline structure of a paper, then that same regard, your heading structure needs to follow that. So you only ever go sequentially down. As in an H1 or an H2 needs to be below an H1. An H3 needs to be below an H2. You don't skip. You don't say, all right, inside of this H2, here's an H4 just because it's smaller. No, you have an H3 and then you style it to look the way you want it to. So oftentimes people get a little bit confused like that because they say, all right, I'm just going to toss this one in because it's smaller, it's bigger, it's more important, this or that. Now it needs to follow a very strict structure as if it were an outline of a page or a document. I got another one for you. Do you mind if I do a little more trivia? Because I find this really ha- really fun. Yes. Okay. Me I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna phrase it so we can get a clip out of it. Do you know what the output tag is in HTML? I've never used yes. this, and this is so. I handy. do know what the output tag. Is. Okay. Yes. I I could tell you. Tell me. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, hands free. This is proof. I'm not looking at anything here. The output element is often used for like if stuff is streaming in from a server response. You could think about this as let, let's say you have a um, a web server, right? And yeah. you're doing a deploy. And that deploy is showing you logs. Those are logs being output from the server process. That's when you would use the output tag. I think that's right. MDN says the HTML element is a container element for a site or app that can inject the results of a calculation or the outcome of a user action. You're right. So uh, you perform a user action, deploy this website, and you want to stream the results back in, or if you simply just want to, like we built a compounding interest calculator in one of my courses, I should have used an output element in there to display the, the value, actual values yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah. It's an interesting and you can, tag. It has a four yeah. attribute, and it takes multiple IDs of which inputs, inputs. they are associated mm. with. Wild. I didn't know about that one. I knew about it, but I never use it because I, didn't, I don't do the, that stuff that much. But it's seeing how it's used here to do calculations I th- or like as the answer for a calculation, that's yeah. someplace I would actually use it that I haven't thought about before. So that's really interesting. Other interesting elements, dialogue. Dialogue is a new element that gives you a modal. It has a lot of great default stylings, but more importantly, it also has accessibility things baked in like the escape key working. So dialogue is a fantastic new element that is fully supported that you should use if you need a modal. Uh, for anything. We can say tables really quick, Wes. Do you ever not use tables for tabular data or table data? That's a great question because sometimes you need to display tabular data, but styling tables is such a pain in the butt. So I find myself being like, "Mm, I bet I can do it with grid. And then I always regret it because I guess now that we have subgrid, it's probably a little bit easier, but still not all that useful. I do find myself using tables. However, I find myself putting a div directly inside of my table cell so that mm. I can style a little bit differently because the actual table cell, the TD, TH, are really hard. There's a lot of limitations. They have a funky display property on them that you can't turn off because then you break how the table works. So I find myself just throwing a div inside of the table cell and then styling that thing how I need it. Yeah, there's a lot there. I mean, tables, for those folks who haven't existed uh, since the dinosaurs were alive, like Wes and I have, you know, tables used to be exist to do like the layout for your entire website because we didn't have great layout tools. Everybody used tables to give yourself a structure for your website. But tables nowadays are still handy for tabular data. They are hard to style. Typically, when I want to figure out a more complex table styling, one of the places I go for inspiration is Stripe. Their dashboards have the best tables. They're styled so well. It's great inspiration for understanding how to style a table and still make it look nice. So you can certainly use tables for this. I have seen people use divs. In fact, the the Drizzle uh, Database Explorer uses divs and display grid. So if you're out there and you're like, I want to see how somebody pro does it that way, the yeah. Drizzle Studio, Drizzle Kit Studio. It does it and it works really well and it looks super nice. So uh, you can do either, but typically you're going to reach for a table and then you're going to be Googling different table properties and CSS (laughs) stuff until you get it to look nice. We also have audio video elements. Those are for 
you guessed it, displaying audio and video. There are a bunch of tags that go along with the audio and video elements for giving multiple sources, as well as for supplying caption tracks to your audio and video. They are not amazing. By default, they work, but there's very little control over them. And almost always, if you're doing anything custom, you're going to want to reach for something that is fully customizable, like, what is it, the media element? What do we use on Media Syntax Chrome. Website? Yeah, Media, media Chrome. Chrome by the Mux folks. If you need video streaming or you need better support or uh, functionality out of the box, Media Chrome is the best way to do it. And it's a, uh, it's a web component, works really great, has a ton of options. And let me tell you, the wide world of video and audio components and elements, man, there are just, there's so many foot guns and complex process and bad libraries that don't work the way you want them to. So Media Chrome is, is the best in my mind. There's also the canvas element, which is a drawing canvas that you can use JavaScript to draw things on. And uh, well, it's actually, uh, canvas can be really super cool for all kinds of things, but it is kind of, I don't know if it's underutilized, but there's some websites and anytime they're doing something that you're looking at it and aesthetically, there's some crazy animations or stuff going on. Yeah. It's almost always Canvas. Canvas is, is doing a lot of cool stuff in West. I've been doing a lot of shader work lately. Yeah. So I've been getting more into Canvas the 3D overall. Canvas. Yeah. So there's 2D Canvas, which is simply you want to draw squares and circles and text to something. But then there's 3D Canvas, which is you can do like twist around and throw a model on there, do shaders. So you've been, what have you been working on with that? Ooh, you know what, really? I ultimately, yeah, ultimately I just want to build really cool looking shit. Uh, that's really what it comes down to is yeah. that uh, shaders allow you to do some crazy stuff and graphics programming in general is a wild world. So even just a, a quick statement on graphics programming, when, you, when you're programming for, you know, graphics stuff in general, you're writing code that affects an individual pixel. So the code you're writing is, hey, on this specific pixel, what's happening? But that code also needs to apply to every pixel on the canvas. So when you're thinking about it, you're not thinking about, all right, you start here and then you adjust all these pixels. You're thinking about all these pixels at once. The current yeah. pixel position, what should this be doing? It's crazy stuff. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more when we, we do. We'll do an episode on shaders and I'll have a lot of cool examples. And you can see what I mean. But uh, canvas is you- pretty neat. You should check out the GitHubUniverse.com website. And this is a, a perfect example of like, well, I'm not building a game. Why do I need to know 3D? But the the tiny little subtlety that you can add with a little bit of 3D canvas is amazing. And I, I dove into it to download the models of all their 3D. And it's pretty wild. They have a whole bunch of masks. And I, I'm assuming it's all exported from some 3D tooling like Spline is a, a really sort of Spine. easy, accessible yeah. one for just regular folks like us to use. But this is such a fun site. This is an incredible site done with shaders specifically. This uh, Maxime Heckel site is, is something that's maybe my favorite website that I've been on in the past five years. I mean, it's incredible. So if you want to see this kind of stuff you can do with Canvas, this is a, a great site to check out as well. There's also a search tag, which you can use to wrap a form or, or for searching. So if you have a search bar, wrap that whole thing in a search tag, the input and everything. So that's one that a lot of people don't use that exists. Most websites have search, or at least a lot of big websites have search. And I don't know how many search tags we're seeing out there. So Beautiful. So that is the fundamentals of HTML. Obviously, there's a lot more to it, but you kind of get the the point of it, right? There's a whole bunch of semantic elements. There's a whole bunch of elements that have baked in functionality in the browser. And then there are several elements like the canvas audio video that will allow you to display the rich media on the page. Let us know if we missed anything you think should be added to the fundamentals. Tweet us at Syntax FM. We'd love to hear it. Yes, absolutely. Cool. Well, let's get into the part of the show where we talk about sick picks and shameless plugs. I have a sick pick today that is a interesting cleaning brush. And this was suggested to me by a chef that I follow. There's a chef from Detroit who uses these, these bamboo walk kitchen cleaning brushes. And they're these bamboo brushes. And the point of them is he was saying, these are the single best things for cleaning your cast iron because Ooh. they're not too abrasive where they're going to scratch off your seasoning or anything like that. Yeah. But they're also 
hard. So it's not like you're using like a scrub daddy sponge or something like that. And you take this bamboo brush and you kind of sh- 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 like you're using a scraper or something and it's not going to oh, scrape off your seasoning. It like chips up any anything that's baked onto the cast iron. Yes. And I was trying to use these on normal pans and stuff and being like, I don't know about this buy. This was kind of an, a weak buy because they didn't work very well. But then the very first time I used it on the cast iron, I saw the light. These things uh, work very well. They're super cheap. Ten bucks for two. And, you know, it's bamboo. So it's going to like they're they're kind of brittle. They're going to break over time. It's not like a uh, buy once thing forever. They're they're slightly disposable. But since they're bamboo, you can feel better about that. Right there. There's sure, no plastic in involved here. Yes, cool. exactly. Yeah, straight up it, bamboo. So it almost yeah, looks ten, like a great green tea whisk for yeah, anyone trying to picture it. Yeah, I know. I I saw these on a Instagram matcha. after this the chef did it, and yeah, I I've been a fan. So yeah, check it out. Oh, cool. I've never seen these before. Abrasives. I, that's I love. I've been using carbon steel for almost two years now. I've been using cast iron for probably fifteen years, and it's so nice to be able to use abrasive cleaning things and abrasive. Um, yeah. spatulas on this type of stuff. That's so good. I just uh, re-seasoned my carbon steel pan the other day, and it was it's quite the quite the experience, but well worth it. How do you get your seasoning off? Because I recently got a bunch of steel wool to re-season my cast yeah. iron because it, it had been it's um, starting to chip up. I have never had one so bad that I had to like, I know like the pros will dip it in electrolysis. So they'll throw it yeah. in like a bath. They'll throw a little anode in there and they'll hook up 12 volts to it and leave it for a while. I've never had one that bad where I really cared about it. I use soap on my cast iron pretty much every time I clean it, which a lot of people are scared of. And it's totally fine. My cast iron is in really good shape. I don't find I really need to strip it off. I just need to re-season as, oh, I'm starting to see the color change. You know, Mm. it's that nice deep black. And as soon as... I start seeing some like lighter ones or if you go too far, a couple drops left on it start to rust. You know, you need to sort of reseason it. And then I go through all the the steps to do that. Mm, I was getting like flaking of the. Oh, after, yeah. After a was period that the, of time. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's usually like just like burnt on on like carbon from from the food that's being left over. And uh, I find that as well, where I have to like super aggressively. Mm. scrub it off you could even use like um like a chain meal like a, oh, you know, yeah, one of those things meal, yeah. I, I i just um, use car or a, a steel wool to get it steel and wool yeah that, it. that'll yeah. work but that's good i am going to sick pick the logitech mx master 3s mouse so i have nice. had the 2s for six years now and you'll see that it is no longer a mouse because I took what it happened? apart. Um, oh, you took it. So I, I was gone for about three, three and a half weeks. And I came back and it wasn't working. I was like, oh, it's, it's probably died. You know, like it, I was gone for so long and the battery died. So I plugged it in and immediately it threw up a low battery light on my screen. And but it wasn't moving, but I could click on it and like I could click my volume buttons on it. And I was like, oh, it's weird. And then it just stopped working completely. So I, I took it apart. I got my I got my whole like like voltmeter here. I checked the batteries. <laughs> I put three volts directly to it. I can't I can't get it back. I think something I one of the capacitors on the charging circuit or there's a little thermometer in the battery that's a resistor. Either that is broken or something. But I have had this thing for so long, it's like falling apart all the plastics on it. So I was like, you know what? I don't got time for this. I'm not gonna fix it. I just <laughs> drove three minutes to the store and bought a new one and I got the 3S because I've had the 2S forever and this is the new one with aluminum wheels on it and it's S which means it's silent and probably Randy is going to be very happy about this because when I'm sitting here just like thinking about what I'm going to say on the podcast I'm always clicking my mouse you know I just click, <laughs> just click, compulsively click, click. yeah yeah and this one is silent and I absolutely love it it's got so many buttons on it you can program them to do volume you can program gestures I'm not big on the gestures because I'd rather use a keyboard shortcut, but I do love it for all the extra controls, opening up spotlight or not spotlight, mm-hmm. um, whatever the Mac OS. Just any, yeah. Yeah. Thing is such a good mouse. I posted on Twitter and like everybody's like, this is the only mouse that is good for web developers. So 
Check it out if you need a new mouse, the MX Master 3S from Logitech. Word. Yeah, I just can't get on the mouse usage, but they look nice and I That's honestly, the, you're, but you're on a whole them, nother yeah. level. You know what I would love to do is to just use the trackpad like you. Yeah. But I, I tried it so many times. Same with the like mechanical keyboards. I think I have like seven mechanical keyboards right now. And <laughs> I have, I have still, too many of them. Yeah. I, don't, I end up just using the one on the laptop 100% yeah. of the time. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, Shales Plugs, check out our YouTube on Syntax. So go to youtube.com, search for Syntax, and you can find us on there. CJ just posted a really good video on Infinite Scroll, um, how to do Infinite Scroll with React, explaining how it all works, both the code as well as like the thought process for doing that type of thing. Awesome, awesome video. Check it on out, Syntax on YouTube. Sick. Cool. Well, we will see you on the next one. Thanks so much for watching, folks. Listening anywhere yet. Peace.